The future always seems interesting and epic. Often in this future, the main ocean for traveling is the endless space, full of events and adventures not always safe, but always exciting. And these adventures began in the middle of the last century, from the first timid steps that humanity was taking into the future. Hello aviators, Sky here, and today we will visit the shores of the largest ocean. We will travel with the man who became the first representative of a special breed, a cosmonaut, on the vehicle that was the first to deserve the honor of being called a spaceship. On October 4th, 1957, radio receivers around the world started beeping, an unremarkable sound that became historical because for the first time this signal was coming from space. It was transmitted from the orbit by the Earth's first artificial satellite. It was a huge breakthrough. The launch of Sputnik 1 is usually considered the starting point of the space race between the USSR and the USA, and Sputnik 1 showed the level of technological achievements of that time, incredible a few years before. But there was one more thing. Sputnik 1 proved that rockets are capable of lifting payloads into space. Up until that point, all the rockets were technically ballistic missiles, and the targets of their cargo were not in space, but on the opposite side of the Earth. The race is a race, and the participants got to their marks. In January 1958, after long disputes in the United States, the Aeronautics Committee was reformed, which resulted in the birth of NASA. In February 1958, the Jupiter-C rocket launched into space artificial satellite, Explorer 1. The idea that something useful could be launched into space quickly captured the minds of people. Sputnik 1 was as simple as possible, and after it, more complex designs began to appear on the engineers' tables. Spacecraft for long-term orbital flights, communication models, spy satellites, and of course, the flight of imagination eventually reached the word spaceship, piloted by a human. This idea was exciting, but it presented a huge number of challenges. Life support is needed, protection from an aggressive environment, how will a person feel in space? Plus, he must be safely brought back to Earth somehow. There was a lot of questions and no answers. No one had ever done anything like that before. But the intense research gave results. The overall design of the device was revised many times, from the simplest spheres and cones to ships that looked like airplanes. But the complex schemes were rejected, too many unknowns in the calculations, and not every model could handle the temperature overloads. The final choice was minimalistic, but optimal. In 1958, some vision of the ship was formed. It was supposed to be a spherical device operating in a low Earth orbit, at a height of about 250 kilometers or 140 miles, capable of withstanding the temperature more than 2000 degrees Celsius as it passed through the atmosphere with nearly 8 to 9 g-force, and weighing about 5 tons or 11,000 pounds. While hundreds of people were working on ships as part of the program called Vostok, which means East in Russian, hundreds of their colleagues were engaged in creating a space transport for it. The choice of a basis for this transport was obvious. The R-7 rocket was a work of art and a real engineering miracle. It was an incredible leap in the industry. All the rockets created before seemed like child's play. Two stages, a package scheme, Four boosters that upon separation formed the iconic Korolev Cross, continuing to fascinate decades later. The extremely complicated engine system compiled of two dozen engines plus steering gears. 32 combustion chambers seemed completely wild at that time, just as wild as a huge launch pad with a set of equipment on it. Technically, the Baikonur Cosmodrome was built for this rocket. All these decisions are not just pretty words. The R-7 was not the best military ballistic missile, but as a carrier rocket it was just perfect, and, with minimal modifications, it was coping well with most of the tasks of the beginning of the space era. It was simply not necessary to create new rockets. The rocket that launched Sputnik 1 into space was in fact a basic ballistic missile, with different flight settings and the replacement of a nuclear warhead with a satellite. In 1959, the first satellites launched by a modified version, equipped with the third stage, flew to the moon. Such a rocket could already handle the delivery of a full-fledged spaceship into orbit, so it was included into the program. It still needed some work, especially the third stage, but the perspective was very good. 
The ship itself at that time was slowly becoming a reality. The device carrying the name Vostok weighed about 4.73 tons or 10.5 pounds and was a coupling of two main modules, the crew capsule and the equipment module. Due to the rocket's ability to launch quite heavy loads and the ambitions of engineers, Vostok, for the very first spaceship in history, was quite a large and advanced vehicle. Of course, it is smaller and lighter than, for example, the Soyuz, but for its time it was huge. The first vehicles of the Mercury series were much more modest, although later, NASA won the rematch with the Apollos. The crew's capsule was equipped with control systems, life support, instruments for carrying out some operations in space, cameras, and of course the descent and landing systems. It was not planned to fly blind, of course. The vehicle received three small windows. However, manual control was considered more of an emergency tool, and the flight was mainly automated and controlled from Earth. The fact is that orbital piloting at that time was still a theoretical concept, and it was not entirely clear how the cosmonaut would feel himself. There were many versions, some thought that nothing out of the ordinary would happen to him, others threatened that he would lose his mind or even die. Since the capsule was about to get very hot upon entering the atmosphere, it received the newest thermal protection covering the entire surface. It was rather massive, almost one and a half tons. The sphere had two large hatches. One was leading inside the spacecraft, the second was hiding the parachute system. But despite the presence of parachutes, the capsule did not have additional systems for braking and smoothing the landing, and the impact on the ground was too traumatic. Therefore, the seat had an ejection system. After braking in the atmosphere, it had to throw the cosmonaut out of the capsule, so he would go down on a parachute separately. The equipment module included the rest of the systems that worked automatically or were controlled remotely. Communication devices, orientation engines, telemetry and tanks were located here. To ensure acceptable reliability for a manned flight, the ship was made as simple as possible. It could not perform orbital maneuvers and was limited to orientation by rotating around the axis. It was equipped with an engine, the role of which was braking at the end of the flight. The engine had to give an impulse to reduce the speed and enter the atmosphere. The following return to the ground was carried out along the ballistic trajectory. The g-forces in such flights were quite high, but then the more complex decisions were even more dangerous. The ship was installed on the third stage unit and hidden under the fairing. Meanwhile a hole was left in the fairing. From the side it looks like some kind of a huge window, but it is actually a hatch through which the cosmonaut enters the ship. The timing of the program was incredible. The test flights of the upgraded rocket with the prototype of the Vostok spacecraft began as early as 1960. Sputnik 4, launched first, was unmanned and did not have any systems. The craft was needed to test the basic design. The flight was going normal, but due to a failure in orientation during the descent, it bounced off the atmosphere to a higher orbit and returned to Earth only two years later. Such a prospect for a real cosmonaut was very gloomy, so they actively worked on the spacecraft to prevent this. The second test launch was completely unsuccessful. This time, life support systems had to be checked, and the vehicle had passengers, dogs, Chaika and Lisichka. But this time, the updated rocket had failed. On the 19th second of flight, one of the booster engines broke down and the rocket exploded. After this accident, work began on ensuring the safety of the crew during the initial phases of the flight. In a sense, Chaika and Lisichka became the parents of the emergency escape systems. Luck smiled at Sputnik 5, launched in the late summer of 1960. The rocket and the vehicle played their roles as planned, and shortly after the launch, the capsule successfully returned to Earth with the passengers. By the way, it was carrying a real zoo. Mice, rats, plants, and of course the main characters of this journey. The dogs, Belka and Strelka. The crew was in perfect shape. A bit later, one of the dogs even gave birth to puppies. In 1961, Nikita Khrushchev presented one of the puppies, Pushinka, to John Kennedy. And in the White House, she met a dog named Charlie, Romeo and Juliet of the Cold War. After this successful flight, a series of trials continued with varying success until March 1961. But Vostok was not developed for dogs, was it? It's time to get acquainted with the real crews of the first spacecraft.
Given the specifics of space travel and its very complex conditions, the task of selecting crews was very difficult. The question of where to look was not hard. The closest in the conditions were the jet fighter aircraft. So, they searched mainly among the military pilots. The requirements were quite detailed. Age, about 30 years old. Height, no more than 170 centimeters, or 5 feet and 7 inches. Weight, no more than 72 kilograms, or 160 pounds. These were the limitations of the vehicle and the rocket. Every centimeter and every kilogram counts as gold. The health requirements were maximal. There were never such high requirements before and even after. The modern space crews are working in more comfortable conditions. Initially, more than 3,000 people participated in the selection. The best pilots of the country. But over time, this number decreased, first to a couple of hundred, then to 20 people. The very first cosmonaut group, each of whom eventually became a legend. Training and testing were very difficult and were carried out continuously for a long time, in parallel with the creation of rockets and spacecraft. Since the cosmonauts did not yet have their own infrastructure, training was conducted mainly in Zhukovsky Aviation Test Site, which had long become a special place for Soviet aviators. And there, at first, they worked on the mock-ups of Vostok. A little later, finally, the Cosmonaut Training Center was formed, which is still operating in Star City, Moscow region. By the way, during the training process inside the capsule, the instructor of the group, the famous test pilot Mark Galai, was always starting with the word Поехали, which means let's roll. Not a very prominent word, yet. The most important hour was approaching. The test flights of Vostok were not ideal, but they allowed to quickly bring the complex to safe operating conditions. Besides, the second participant of the race was getting very close. In 1958, NASA, almost immediately after its creation, started the Mercury program, the goal of which was also manned space flights. In the spring of 1959 were announced the names of seven people preparing for these flights, the first astronauts. All the path converged in April 1961. The Vostok spacecraft was preparing for flight. There were also many disputes about the choice of the first cosmonaut. The main candidates were Yuri Gagarin and German Titov. In early April, the Soviet government made a formal decision to launch a man into space, and the state committee for launching the spacecraft Vostok approved the first flight mission. To run a single turn flight around the Earth at an altitude of 180 to 230 kilometers, lasting 1 hour 30 minutes, landing in the designated area. The purpose of the flight was to check the ability of a human to stay in space on a specially equipped vehicle, check the spacecraft's equipment and flight, check the spacecraft's communications with Earth, ensure the efficiency of the spacecraft's and the cosmonaut's landing equipment. It was decided that Gagarin would fly, and Titov was appointed as backup. Finally, 58 years ago to this day, on April 12, 1961, came the moment of truth. Usually the first manned flight into space is described as a fairly simple operation. He boarded the ship, took off, and an hour and a half later landed on a field somewhere near the river Volga. But in reality, this voyage was a bit more complicated. Pre-launch operations with the rocket and spacecraft were being carried out since the day before. At 3 o'clock in the morning on April 12th, they were already completed, while the management of the Cosmodrome and the design bureau, including Sergei Karalev, were overseeing the work. A few hours later, a final meeting of the Space Committee was held, which issued the flight task and concluded that Vostok 1 and its crew, cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin, are ready for launch at the appointed time. By 7 a.m., the cosmonaut was already stationed in the vehicle. Everyone who could attend was seeing him off. The work supervisors, the designers, and of course the rest of the cosmonaut group. Everyone understood that the risks were still very high. There was a huge number of factors, every one of which could lead to a tragedy. Pre-flight works were carried out very carefully, and all systems were rechecked several times, so by the time of the announcement of the 15-minute readiness, Gagarin had already been sitting in the spacecraft for an hour. Then everything went smoothly. At 9 am, the one-minute readiness was announced. The key to start command was given at 9.03, and after another four minutes, the rocket carrying the spaceship Vostok 1, with a roar, took off from the launch pad and the radio broadcasted the soon-to-be-iconic 
At the start, the rocket performed perfectly. Soon, the boosters of the first stage successfully detached and, going into their classic rotation, moved away from the departing rocket. The second stage also worked as planned, after which the third was already taking the ship to the designated orbit. At that time, Vostok 1 was flying at a height of 150 km above the Earth at a speed of more than 27,000 km per hour. Gagarin became the fastest and the highest flying person in history, although at that moment he didn't care about records. Because of the high g-forces, the cosmonaut was on the verge of losing consciousness and full of admiration. After the separation of the fairing, Earth appeared behind the window. And then, the ideal flight pattern began to distort. At the final moments of the ascent, the third stage engine shutdown systems didn't work. The reverse system did its part, but the stage had already raised the spacecraft above the planned height. Its perigee was at an altitude of about 180 kilometers, close to what was needed. But the apogee went beyond 300, which could be a problem. The engineers remembered Sputnik 4, stuck in orbit, and calculated everything so that even if the retro engines had failed, the vehicle would have still entered the atmosphere within several days. And now, with such a high altitude of flight, he risked remaining in space for a month, or even more. Finally, after the separation of the third stage, Vostok 1 stabilized in its orbit. Then came weightlessness and silence. Yuri Gagarin officially became the first man in space. The first cosmonaut conducted the experiments assigned to him. He drank, ate, communicated with Earth and described his observations. Not the most difficult operation, but even that was very serious, considering that scientists at that time knew almost nothing about manned orbital flights. It was easy to carry out the tasks, there was nothing supernatural, except maybe for the view through the window. Before the eyes of the first cosmonaut, there was a view of Earth from the orbit, a view that no one had ever seen before him. For some time, the connection with the ship was lost, Vostok 1 entered the shadow of the Western Hemisphere and flew over the sleeping America. But not everyone was sleeping there. Signals from Kedar, the call sign of Gagarin, were intercepted by the radar station of the US Air Force on the Aleutian Islands. Soon, NASA learned the news invigorating in the middle of the night. All the necessary tasks were completed by 10 o'clock in the morning, and Vostok 1 itself completed the first turn around the Earth. In fact, only one turn was needed, which means it was time to return home. The retro engine worked, but as it turned out, its impulse was smaller than planned. The automatics determined its performance as insufficient to enter the atmosphere, which means that the flight continues and there is no need to separate the service module from the re-entry module. But even though the impulse was weaker than planned, it nevertheless was enough. The ship was losing altitude and entering the atmosphere with the element that should not have been there. Vostok 1 began to rotate uncontrollably. The equipment module was supposed to burn in the atmosphere, but now it could take the landing capsule with it. The reserve system saved the situation. The thermal sensors were triggered, giving the command for separation. The capsule finally got free and flew to the Earth as planned. The descent along the ballistic trajectory means that the capsule of Vostok 1 turned in fact into a meteor with a person inside, burning hot to several thousand degrees with 8 to 10 g-force. But still, the flight could be considered more or less normal. At an altitude of about 7 kilometers, in accordance with the protocol, Gagarin left the spacecraft. He descended by parachute separately. The capsule, also by parachute, was descending nearby. But even here a problem occurred. The cosmonaut's spacesuit was airtight, which was necessary to ensure safety. But now it became a problem. The valve opening access to the surrounding atmosphere did not open, and the air supply in the spacesuit was running out. Gagarin almost suffocated, being in fresh air surrounded by spring nature. Fate, clearly not devoid of dark sense of humor, was leading the first cosmonaut through a very thin ice. But the valve too eventually opened. The last puzzling moment the parachute descended right into the river Volga, the waters of which in April are not good for swimming. But this problem was also solved, and Yuri Gagarin finally touched the ground of the Saratov region in the USSR. He spent 1 hour and 48 minutes in the sky, and flew nearly 41,000 kilometers, or 25,000 miles. This meeting was pretty unusual for the locals, but they decided that since he speaks Russian, he is probably an earthling. 
Soon the military arrived, who were warned in advance that on April 12th they may observe the fall of a container from the sky. Yuri Gagarin himself, from a pilot working in a secret program, quickly became the most famous person in the world. On April 14, the Il-18 with the first cosmonaut on board, accompanied with the MiG-17 escort, arrived to Moscow. Then there were parades, solemn meetings, hundreds of events, international visits and everything else. The whole thing. In parallel, he continued to participate in the space program. He was a milestone in the history of space exploration, but he understood that these were just the first steps in the endless journey of conquering space. On May 5th, Freedom 7 sent Alan Shepard into space. On August 6, Vostok 2 sent German Titov into space. Then there were new ships, new rockets, orbital maneuvers, docking, spacewalks, landing on the moon, and space stations. 58 years have passed since that chilly April morning. More than 560 people from 35 countries have already been in space. Together, they spent more than 10,000 days in orbit, 100 of which outside the stations and ships. Right now, the International Space Station crew of six people works under the stars. Oleg Kononenko and Alexey Avchinin from Russia, Anne McLean, Nick Haig and Christina Koch from the USA, and David Sanjak from Canada. Private companies are conquering the near space, and national agencies are exploring the immense worlds, in solar system and beyond. Years, decades and centuries will pass before mankind becomes a cosmic scale civilization. And then our distant descendants will look at the past and wonder what insane dark ages their ancestors lived in, and how did they manage to lay the foundations of their future. The galactic routes, the warp engines, the ring worlds in outer space, colonies on Mars and stations hanging in the roaring clouds of Venus were built later. The huge vehicles, space stations above the Earth and the Moon, Soyuz, Apollo, Saturn and Energia were built later. Over time there will be thousands and millions of astronauts, cosmonauts, taikonauts and other nauts. And up there, in this infinite space, each and every one of them, from the first admiral of the space fleet to the last battered smuggler, will remember that it all began in the frantic 20th century, from a family of people rushing into space, in which the elder brother, on April 12, 1961, became Yuri Alexeyevich Gagarin. Happy Cosmonautics Day! Fast flights, soft landings, blue sky and bright stars to you!